Hello and welcome to the next part of the series where I am overhauling the interaction system in the AI behaviors package. So last time was pretty lengthy uh, for the amount of stuff we were needing to set up. It was the bulk of sort of that, that setup stage of things. Uh, this one is definitely going to be shorter in this part, and there will actually be a third part as well, just to keep it so that it is not a uh, horrific amount of stuff to be watching at one point. However, if you're wanting to skip right ahead with the code, that's going to be doable. So in the description below, there are going to be three links. One is a link to the code as it is at the start of this project, or start of this video. Uh, the other is a link to the code at the end of this video, and then the final is a link to the completed package. So depending upon when you're watching this, the completed package uh, might be you know, further along because there's always other things I'm looking at adding to it. Uh, but all of that code is available for this and all of the other uh, following videos for it is already there. So if you're wanting to jump ahead, that's available. Our focus in this section is finishing off some of the areas like the interaction selector, uh, getting some of the core infrastructure updated sort of in preparation for going and updating all of the behaviors and getting things like our prefabs and everything in the scenes updated. So we won't have it at the point where it is using the interactables, uh, but we will have everything set up so that next time we're just focusing on updating the individual behaviors and on testing things. So let's dive on in. Okay, so a couple of things that we're going to get up and running to begin with. So one of the things that we set up in terms of an interface for was this interaction selector. But we haven't actually implemented any versions of that. So what I'm going to do is set up a folder where we'll have those. So I'll have our selectors folder. Uh, now this is one where I do actually want a base class because there is some common logic uh, that we want to be able to make use of for all of the different ones. So we'll have interaction selector base. And I'm also going to set up just as a you know, out of the box available one, one that can just pick randomly. So we'll have a interaction selector random. So we're just going to get those two up and running. So, okay, our base is the first one we're going to populate. So it is going to be abstract. Uh, it is going to be a mono behavior. And we'll have our interaction selector. Now, in terms of then what it does, so there's going to be a few interfaces we have to make available. Uh, for now, a lot of these can be a concrete implementation. So our registry, going to do the by now very familiar get and protected set. Uh, we're going to do similar for things like our ranges here. As min search range will default to false. Do the same for our min range, but that'll default to zero. Max also false. Actually, no, I will give a, a max one by default and I'll give that a reasonable value. Now the three or four of these are something that I want the user to be able to configure those. So what I'm going to do, because they are fields, is as we've done with other ones, mark these as being a serialized field like that. So that's good. Now, this needs to register itself with the service locator. So we're going to have a virtual, actually we'll just have for now void awake. 
and so our service locator we need to register us and we make sure that we always use the interface when we are registering uh, and the context is the game object so the reason we always uh, make sure that we use the interface here is just so that then when we're doing a lookup we can look up based on interface not based on the concrete class uh, now the other thing that we want to do here is we want to actually do an async locate service for our interactable registry and we have our usual logic that we do here so all this is to do is just actually populating that registry so that's good and when we're doing that locate for it uh, we want to provide null and global only that shouldn't be something that we're trying to find uh, on a local object so that's good. We've got the location of it happening. Pick interaction uh, is one that we will get to in a moment. I'm going to have an on awake here so that I can do a protected virtual void on awake just in case there's any customization that a child class might want to do. don't think there is at this stage, but just handy to actually have. So, okay, let's get our pick interaction set up. So first thing we're going to do is populate our out values. Just make sure those are populated to begin with. Well, okay, one scenario is we might have no performer. In that case, we just fail out because there's no point trying to have it pick an interaction when we don't have a performer. At the moment, there's not really a strict need. There's not any information it pulls from the performer, but I could definitely see later on that we would want to support being able to filter what interactions particular performers themselves might actually support or have other criteria there. So I don't want to start this out on the basis of being able to support picking an inter interaction without a performer that's valid. So that's sort of why is just a little bit of future proofing there for it. Uh, so then what I'm going to do is get our filtered interactables which to do that I need to go okay well hey registry I want you to filter interactables by predicate and in terms of them with that predicate I'm actually going to set that up here so we have our in call this just candidate like that so that's good so I want to filter these by distance that's one thing I have to actually support so I'm going to have my performer location I'm going to cache it so the reason I want to cache it is because just in case that's doing extra logic it means that I'm not rerunning that every single time because I'd rather not so then our distance here, so our distance squared, well, if we have a min search range or if we have a max search range, then I'm going to say that that distance squared is our performer location minus the candidates. Uh, query location so this is why we set up that query location and we get the square magnitude otherwise 
we're just going to set it to be zero. Then what I'll do here is, okay, well, if we have a min search range and if that distance squared, oops, the distance squared is less than that minimum search range, but we need to be doing the square of that. So if it is less than that, then we return false. And then we have a similar setup for with the max one. So if we have a max search range, and if the distance squared is beyond the max, then we return false. Otherwise, we can default to returning true, but I'm also going to check, is that candidate usable? Because if they are not usable, then again, we want to filter them out. So we're applying general distance filtering. We're applying the actual uh, logic here for if it's not usable. So, okay, now the end result of this could be, well, if filtered interactables is null, or if filtered interactables is empty, well, there's nothing we can do. We just return false because we don't have anything valid to actually use. Otherwise, we've now got a set of interactables, but we need to populate both the interactable and the interaction. So we need a secondary stage that actually runs. So what I'm also going to set up here, and this I will make abstract, so I'm going to have an abstract and this will be bool. And this is going to be uh, pick interaction internal. This gets a list of our interactables. So this is our new candidate list of candidate interactables. I'll pass the performer in as well. So we have our performer, we have the candidate interactables, and then what this needs to provide is, and I'll actually just steal it from up here, because it's the exact same setup in terms of, okay, we need those out ones. So, okay, we have those. Now, we did have this support for an additional filter, and that additional filter runs on an interaction, and this is actually where we use it. We pass it to that internal helper. So what we do down here is this gets added there as well. Now. I am zoomed in a fair bit with this, but I am just going to, that line is pretty lengthy anyway, so I'm going to just uh, neaten that up so that it's a little bit more manageable for actually seeing it on the screen. So that's good. So what I will then do here is we'll return, pick interaction internal, Pass in the performer, pass in our filtered list, we pass in our various out parameters, and we pass in the additional filter like that. We need to, because these are out ones, properly indicate that. But that's good. That gives us our base logic for this for being able to perform what we need it to do. So now we can actually set up our random one. And it's reasonably straightforward in terms of what it needs to do. So this one that inherits off of our interactable selector base. Get rid of all of these. 
Now, it's going to be grumpy at us uh, because we don't have these things implemented, which is completely fair. So, in terms of what this needs to do, well, we always need to populate our out parameters first. That's sort of my general approach. I'll default to returning false for this one. Uh, so I always initialize the out parameters essentially to their failure mode value first so that it's if I'm then returning later, it's very clear and easy of what I need to actually be doing. So we need to do a similar process again with actually filtering these. Uh, we need to build up our set of candidates essentially. So we're going to have a list I interactions. And these are going to be our candidate interactions. And what I would say with this is that's going to initially just be a new list. The reason being, and the reason I'm doing it uh, by iterating through all of the interactables and so forth is because at this stage, I've kind of got the interactables, which many of them are going to contain interactions. And then from those interactions, I want to pick. So I don't want to randomly pick an interactable, find that maybe there's a specific thing I can't use on it for this particular performer. It just gets a little bit messy. So I think it's cleaner to do it this way. So we're going to loop over all of the interactables. Actually, I'll just use var. It's neater. So I'll have interactable in our in candidate interactables. So from that, we then loop over all of the interactions. So we have our interaction in interactable and our interactions like that. Well, there's a couple of things that will immediately knock one out. So if that interaction is not usable, then it's immediately eliminated. So we skip it. The other thing that would knock ones out is if we have an additional filter that's valid, and if that additional filter actually returns false for it. So if it rules it out as well. So if that's the case, then what I would do is I would say that we continue. So that looks good. Otherwise, we just actually can populate it. So, so far, so good. That's looking all right. Now, okay, if I have candidate interactions, oops. so if I have valid amount of candidate interactions, then I can pick one. So I initially populate our out found interaction. Uh, so that is equal to candidate interactions, and we just do a random range. And because system has gotten dragged in, which I normally manage to prevent, but every so often it just finds its way into the usings and just makes a mess of everything. I do wish with the autocomplete, like it's great that it brings in the usings, I wish it was just a way to make it that there were particular ones that it just didn't bring in by default, because it just is a pain. It's, you know, there are cases very validly where you would want to bring in system, but because I'm doing, you know, using random a lot with this stuff. So in gameplay code, we're often interacting with things where we want to be using the Unity engine version of things. We don't want to be using the system one. Uh, but such is the way that it works. So I've picked a random interaction. I can get my interactable because it's actually going to be the owner of the interaction. And then I can just return true. So that's good. 
that's all that we need for our random one. The only additional bit that I will add is similar to what I did with these. I was setting up our add component menu. I'm going to add that in for this. Selector. Random. So all of our AIs will actually get that added to them. Uh, so that's good. So that's part of what I then want to do is actually update things like our AIs. So I'm going to do quickly update the prefabs essentially for all of these. So these are all in our sample folders. Uh, now conveniently, I can just add this in to our base prefabs here. So I only need to add it into four locations. Still a bunch of places to add it, but it means that it's just a simple thing to add in. So each of these gets the random selector. So that's good. So everything has that populated. Good. So that's promising. So what I then want to do is, okay, we set up last time the logic for the microwave. We set up our target marker, things like of that. Going to actually, because we cleaned up other bits, I can open that prefab and get rid of that interaction marker. So that's good. So I want to apply that same setup to these other ones. So what I'm going to do is I'll actually just edit the bookshelf base itself. Uh, so I'm going to do similar thing of having look targets. So the look at point, I have already configured that. I just need to give it the appropriate script. Uh, we have an empty folder for our interaction points. So with that, I believe those are not sort of customized currently, uh, but I will have those have our oriented one. I'm going to end up likely modifying these a little bit once I can see it in the scene. But we'll give it two interaction points. Uh, I will remove stuff like the smart object and instead uh, add in our interactable. And then I will also add in an entry for our interactions, which what we're going to do is uh, we'll have read comic. So the read comic one, that's just a simple interaction. It's not mutually exclusive. We'll say there's a, a good amount of comics there, so a bunch of folks can actually be using it, which is cool. We add in our, in this case, multiple interaction points because we're going to say at least two people could be using this. Uh, what I will also then do is give that an appropriate duration. Uh, we'll also have a, because this is something I tend to do of being browsing aimlessly while I try and pick something and that ends up being just most of what I do when I go to look at a uh, bookshelf or pick what I want to watch because it's hard to choose because there's too many options. So we'll have both of those there as interactions. They've 
can use the same look targets and the share the same interaction points. So when I actually look at it here then, those interaction points, the left and right ones, well the orientation of those needs to change because they're not facing the bookshelf. So I'm going to rotate those by minus 90. And our left point, now that's also not quite positioned where I would like it to be. So I'm actually going to adjust this. So let's move. That's actually interesting that it's kind of messed up the position of those a little bit. Interesting. Uh, so we're going to move. Ah, because it's in Z, of course. So we'll have one there. So I might make it minus 0.75. Uh, and the right one can be at 0.75. So if I override and apply all of that, then that looks good. Our interaction points, those are at a appropriate distance away. So that looks good. Happy with that. So that's our bookshelves updated. Now the TV. TV is a bit more complicated. Because before, for the TV, we have this concept of it being able to be powered. We had a bunch of you know things there where it had hooks for turning the power off and on. Now that was able to be handled directly before because of the fact that it you know was just hard linking essentially to stuff. It's not really what I want to be doing now with this and also I want to you know I don't have a simple case where like with the microwave you can only do one thing at a time that applies to all the actions the TV it you know might be the case that I want to allow multiple different things to happen to it so I kind of want it to have a bit more control over uh, which things are able to be done at what time because if it's turned off, you can't watch anything. So it needs some additional logic. So I'm going to get a few things set up for it. And it means there needs to be a bit more communication that actually happens with stuff. So one of the things that we're going to really need to be able to support for things like of that TV and everything is a bit more in the way of custom hooks. Uh, that we can actually make use of. So in our simple interaction, this I want to add in a couple of key additions here. So I'm going to give this some Unity events. And actually, I might do this as writing multiple of this in one go. Reason being, that they're all going to be serialized fields. All of them are going to be a unity event. And as a minimum, they all are going to take in our interaction performer and an interaction. And they will all be on something event. which will default to null. Now I need to manually bring in the using because when you're doing multi-line editing, uh, it doesn't actually bring those in for you, which is completely fine. So we'll have an on began event. Uh, we will have our on uh, finished, on completed event, I think will make sense and on abandoned event and are on ticked event. So the tick one does need to uh, take in a couple of additional parameters uh, because we just want to follow the same logic that we do for the other ones. Now what this means is that we have a bunch of areas where 
We are notifying the owner of particular stuff and where we're potentially then uh, invoking these events. It starts to get to a point where you know, we're repeating stuff here. If we ended up with multiple code paths, that could get a little messy. And I think I would be nice to have child classes be able to hook into this directly themselves if they want. So I'm going to have, again, I'm going to do the whole multi-line thing here. So I'll we'll have protected virtual void, and these will be on something interaction for the different ones that we actually have. Uh, they will get the interaction performer is something that all of them will have. And that will do uh, for now with those. Neaten that up. So we will have our on began interaction. We'll have our on ticked. Uh, that will have our in progress. Well, sorry, yeah, we have our in time elapsed and then in progress. That. Uh, and then we have our on completed and we'll have our on abandoned. So this will just allow us to neaten up essentially how we work with this. So our owner finished interaction. We'll bring that down here. Uh, former we're able to provide and then we can just have our event will actually kick that off so we have our on completed event provide the performer like that and we just need to do an invoke so that's good uh, and we just provide this so similar process for a lot of these. Uh, so what that will mean is here, I can just do on completed interaction. Good. Uh, then after our on completed one, we're going to do similar uh, for our ticked. So this we'll get rid of and we'll do on ticked interaction. Uh, oops, in performer, just performer, entry time elapsed and progress. So then we can come down here, put that in and our on ticked event invoke that with our performer, our time elapsed, and our progress. So that looks good. Oh, and we need to make sure we provide the interaction. Uh, now that also means that in our start one here, where we were doing uh, this logic, we can just do our on ticked interaction Let's pass that through so that's good that one uh, so so far good this would change to our on completed interaction Good so far. Now, a couple of other ones that we would need to then update is our begin one. 
we're going to grab that. So on began, and provide the performer. So I'm nearly done with these. I've covered all of the particular ones apart from the abandoned, which again, with that, we would have on abandoned interaction and our former. We likely also have that here. So on abandoned interaction, this just means that in future we'd have less issues of things that we need to go and update. It just keeps it a little bit neater. Uh, on abandoned event, like that. That's just a bit a bit cleaner and a bit neater. Uh, and what I will also do is this complete interaction just to actually make it a little bit clearer in terms of what it does. I'm going to rename that as cleanup interaction because I think that's actually more accurate. Uh, now, in the cases where we call this, so just want to check, okay, wherever are we actually calling that? So we call that here if the duration is zero. Uh, and we also call that here when things are actually done. And if they are, then it goes and actually uh, calls the particular logic for running that on completed. I think that's okay. We may end up refactoring that at a later point, but I think for now uh, that keeps it pretty, pretty clean and straightforward. So that means we can set up our TV side of things now and the new logic that it will have. Because uh, it is going to be pretty different. So I'm going to create our usual set of ones that we now have of look targets. Uh, we're going to have our interaction points. And we're going to have our interactions. Oops. another empty one there. So that's good. So then in terms of interactions, uh, we'll have toggle power. We will add to that a simple interaction because now that we have these events, that makes it easy for us to work with them. Uh, and that's all I'll add in without going and updating the prefab. The reason being is I'm then going to open the prefab so I can actually restructure stuff. So our interaction marker, I want to move under that and I'll look at point. So now I'll go back to the scene and because that's just a little bit easier to then work with. Uh, these. So our look at point that gets our look target simple. Our interaction point, well, that we need to fix the rotation on it so it's facing the correct way. Uh, we also need to move that uh, back a bit, I would say. Two's probably about right. And we'll also lower that. Don't want it to be uh, through the terrain, but I'll just create a cube under it so we can easily visualize where it is. There we go. A little bit above halfway is good. Uh, so we're going to have middle, but I also want to have left and right. So the one on the right, 
Uh, if we do that, and the left, I'll also move it. So all three of those get our interaction point oriented. Look at point is all good. Our TV object itself, uh, we're going to remove. We can't till we get rid of these scripts. So we're going to remove all of these. And like that. Now we'll be able to remove that component and apply. Now we're not going to add the interactable yet uh, because the interactable is something where we need to populate a bunch of things for it. And we're actually going to set up a custom class. Uh, so what I am going to link up is our interaction points. So we want to be able to interact with this from middle, left, or right. And I want to have that look target. So power doesn't need a duration. Uh, I'm going to then have, uh, we'll call this uh, watch short program. And that's going to be mutually exclusive. So while we're watching that, we can't watch other things. That'll be from three to five seconds. We'll also have uh, watch long program. That will be from, let's say, four to eight. And uh, we might just have uh, channel surf. So a few different interactions there. We're going to apply all of those overrides. So that's good. And then now what we can do is we can set up our actual uh, TV logic. So that's the sort of big thing we need uh, for this because that's a bit of custom logic that it's going to need to do. Okay, so we already know that our TV is going to need some custom logic for it. So where this used to live, uh, in terms of our logic is we did have our smart object section here under the framework essentials. I'm going to instead set up a folder for interactables. And then I'm going to create a script in it. And what this is going to be is this is going to be an interactable. TV. Now in terms of what it does, it's not going to be too much that we need to set up on it. So it's going to be an interactable uh, and it'll be based on a simple interactable. So that's not completing. So I'm just going to check to make sure that our framework essentials has the correct entries. Ah, so framework essentials needs character core as an assembly definition. Now it will actually be able to populate it. I thought it was odd that it was not finding it. So once Visual Studio decides to get with the program. Okay, so we can then set up this script after we relaunch Visual Studio due to it being grumpy. So this does now have a simple interactable. There we go. It's properly found at this time. So, okay. In terms of what we need this to do, a couple of things. So one thing that we need this to do is keep track of if it's actually on. So we're going to have is on, and that can be a get and a private set, and we will default it to off. I want to have a helper 
for toggling the power. And that's going to be pretty straightforward in terms of what it does. So that's good. Now, one of the things that I did want to be supporting with this is handling the idea of, you know, those uh, interactions requiring power. So I need to actually know which ones have power needs. So I'm going to have to do the uh, less elegant method of having a list of game objects. Uh, so this is interaction that need power. So we'll actually call that interaction game objects. Because internally, what I will then do is I will actually maintain a list of interactions, and this will be interactions requiring power. And so that's something that I will actually populate uh, into this. So what I can do for populating that is we already have an override for initialize that I can make use of. So what I will do is if the interaction game objects that need power is not equal to null and just wrap these in parentheses. Not strictly necessary, but it makes it just clearer of what's actually happening. So if it's valid, then what I want to do is I want to go through all of those. So interactions firing power is a new list like that. So we just loop over the game objects. So interaction game object in each of those. Then we're just going to attempt to retrieve that particular interaction. So interaction. We go for our game object. We'll do a get component uh, of that. And if that's valid, then we just add that into our list. That's just going to build up that list of which ones actually need power. That's going to make life a lot easier. What I can then do is I override our usable check. Uh, and actually, that has to be a public override. And if we go and take a look at our interactable simple one here, we did not make that virtual. So that definitely should be virtual. We'll do similar for a bunch of these ones here just because those actually should be, because we want to support inheritance with these. Uh, I will make that interaction point one. Pretty much all of these actually, because they're common logic that we would want to uh, potentially override. So that's just going to make life a little easier for us. And then now we should see is usable, which we do. So if that base version says that it's not usable, then we immediately return false. Otherwise, if it is not on and we have interactions that require power, actually defined, so if we have valid ones, then we need to check 
Otherwise, the default is going to be true. So if it's not turned on, and we have interactions that require power, then whether we can actually perform this or not is going to be down to whether interactions requiring power contains this interaction we're asking about. So that in that in interaction uh, could be no. That's fine. That's just going to check then uh, if any could actually be performed, which in that case our interaction as long as you know, we have essentially more interactions that require power than you know, are actually there, which for the TV we know there'll be the on in the toggle power interaction, it's going to be fine. So that looks good. Uh, this, we're going to give this the same sort of add component menu. So if we go up here, we're going to make sure that it's got that. Uh, and interactable TV. We can now uh, select our TV. We can give it that interactable. Now we know we have some interactions here that require power like watching the different programs uh, or channel surfing. All of those require power uh, and everything else is mutually exclusive, including the toggle power one. That'll just prevent people turning the power off on the TV while someone's mid-watching it. Uh, then the toggle power one, well, when that completes, we are going to have that talk to the TV itself, and it is going to run our toggle power function. So that is our TV updated. So we've updated all of those in this particular scene. What I should check is when I go to another scene, uh, does it get all of that picked up correctly? So we definitely want to save that scene. So I'm going to just check here. So that looks correct for the TV. Bookshelf, those look correct. The microwave. Now that one is not correct, but that's okay. We just go to the prefab and we can do a revert all. So that's good. We'll update our other scenes now that we know that there are issues we'll run into with that. And we know that it will be the microwave in each case. So we can just select that microwave and we revert it back to what the prefab is set to. Uh, so with all of these changes, that does mean that at this particular stage, there will be no interactions that anything can use. And that's okay, uh, because that's what the final part is going to sort out, is going to be sorting out so that we actually have uh, the behaviors all up and running. That's good. We've updated all of those scenes now uh, with the newly structured interactables. The final bit that I'm going to add in is really just some, some fairly minor changes, but they're going to get us positioned essentially for it being very straightforward with updating the behaviors. So there's a few things I want to go and update. And these are largely in all of our sort of core logic for the behaviors. So with our behavior tree, we want to make it the things can easily access our uh, logic in terms of finding the uh, interaction interface, stuff like of that. So with the behavior tree, we already have a bunch of interfaces being populated here. So I'm going to have our interaction selector 
available for everything. Uh, so I'm going to call that our interaction interface like that. Uh, we also are going to need easy access, oops, not to the selector, but to the performer. Set so our performer interface. Now, what that also means is those need to be passed in to this. So I'm going to update uh, these. So we already have now that performer one there. Uh, but I want to also have our interaction selector interaction interface. So we update our I behavior tree. That's going to just make that work a lot more reliably for in, you know, finding things. It's going to be stuff we need. Uh, now that does mean we then need to update things like our behavior tree instance, because we can see we're getting errors for that, which is to be expected. So that's where I can tell it to implement these. Now I am going to bring these up so they are positioned alongside everything else. And we'll do the same setup stuff that we have for other ones. So that's good. We just have those linked up. Now our initialize function you can see that it ended up adding in a duplicate, uh, which is less than helpful of it. So what I will do is replace this and we'll just make this a little bit easier to see everything that's actually being passed in here. Good. Uh, now we need to make sure we link things up. So our interaction interface and our performer interface, those get linked up. So that looks good. So that's all we need to modify with the BT instance. So those get populated. But when we go and modify that, then other things break. That's to be expected. So our brain base, that is going to also need those interfaces in it. So I'm going to grab the corresponding lines and bring those over. Uh, just so we're setting them up alongside the rest of this. Now, our brain base is also going to be the performer. So that enforces a couple of uh, interfaces that we have to actually populate, but that's straightforward. Our display name ends up being game object name and our performer location, uh, we are just going to give it transform position. Now we have a few more services we need to locate so that we can populate things. So a couple of ones that we need to do, and these are both local services. So we can actually do that here. So what we are looking for is our interaction selector. So we just update that. One of them. And then we also are going to search for our performer. And we'll populate that. Now that is, whoops, let's try spelling it correctly. We did set that up here. Oh, I accidentally copied the wrong ones. So let's make sure we bring over the correct ones. We don't need a duplicate look at interface. We do need the performer interface. 
So, okay, that looks good. We are properly finding those uh, and linking them up. We do need to register ourselves as the performer. So our service locator, we register. And what we are registering, we do this as a I performer like that. So it's properly registered and we're registering ourselves and context is on the game object. So that's good. There'll still be one other thing that's going to be grumpy at us. Uh, and that is where we're doing the initializing here because we need to provide. So we have our look handler and then we have our interaction interface and our performer interface like that. So that's good. Those are now properly linked up. We save all of that. So it should be mostly out of errors, uh, but we do see with our go action that's to be expected because there's a couple of other areas we need to be updating. Uh, so what that means is things like our go action base. We actually need to get a few things set up. So we're going to follow a similar process. We're going to have those interfaces are going to end up in our go action base. So we're going to populate those here. So that's good. So we're going to follow the conventions we have for these other ones uh, where these are just protected and where we're not setting those up as properties like that. So that's good. We've got those linked up. Now we need to do our service location. That's why I kept this open because we need the exact same logic for doing the lookup. Good. At some point, this is one of those things where I do want to clean that up a little bit as well of reducing uh, the number of areas where we do need to duplicate things. Uh, but so far, that's good. It means our behavior tree one here. We can provide our interaction interface and our performer interface. So it should be happy. And we can see no further errors on that side. So that's good. Our gope goal is also going to need these. So if we go to our hybrid gope and our goals, I'm going to add in the same logic from setup. So we were doing, don't actually currently in the uh, brains, we don't do any uh, finding of stuff, but I am going to do that actually here now, just because this is stuff that uh, the brains do need to actually make use of, because they need to be able to query things like, well, can the performer do this? And that can affect the priorities. So there's stuff that it has to have access to. So that means we need these storages as well. So that's going to make the goal base happy. Uh, so largely we're pretty well sorted. Uh, we did, I believe, update, we updated our behavior tree brain base, but to populate those things, and things like our performer and that, our gope brain actually is separate. So we have our gope brain base uh, and it needs to be, if we go down to, we don't need our element or our planner, 
but the actual brain here, this base brain also needs to be an interaction performer, which means we have a couple of things that have to be implemented. So our display name, again, we go with our game object name. And for the location, we again use our transform position. But really the main addition that we have here is our service locator. We register as the performer. And what we are registering is ourselves in the context of the game object. So that's good. Some common updates for our gope brain. Our behavior tree brain has been updated. We also shouldn't forget that we have our state machine brain as well. Uh, because our state machine brain is going to need the same updates as the goat brain did. So this needs to be our interaction performer, which much like with the goat one, that means we have a couple of things that have to be implemented. Those are able to be linked up the same way we've done other ones. We have our transform position. And then we also want to make sure with these, our state machines are actually going to need to be retrieving these services too. But what I'm initially going to do is make sure we are registering ourselves as the performer. So register this in the context of the game object. Then we are going to, similar to what we had on our brain base, bring that over here because the brains need to do a fair bit. Uh, so they need to have easy access to these bits of logic. Those are going to need to be uh, potentially public for this, so it can actually be finding and accessing them uh, in all of the key ones that we need to, similar to what we have for the look handler. So that's good. We've got those linked up. We've got those key bits uh, connected there for those different brains. So with those bits added in, largely sort of housekeeping things, we can check back in Unity. We've got no errors, so that's good. So where we're at now, we have gone through and implemented all of the core logic for the interaction system. We have gone through and updated all of our prefabs so they are fully migrated to the new system. And we have also gone and done a little bit of sort of groundwork to make it easy for us to then update our various behavior tree and state machine actions, which is going to save us a fair bit of time with the final part. So this has been fairly lengthy, not as ridiculously lengthy as the first part. And there will be the third part that will cover the remaining sections of this. Thanks folks, hope you found the video interesting and helpful. If you have, chuck in a like and subscribe, it really helps out, it's really appreciated. If you are looking for the code for the project, there are three links in the description below. The first is to the code as it was at the beginning of this video. The second is to link to the code as it is now. And the third is a link to the completed package. So all of that code is there and available. If you have any questions, chuck those in a comment below. And if you're looking for other ways to support the channel, then I do have a Patreon, and there's a link to that in the description also. But until next time, 